Well, good morning. A little bit of behind the scenes. If you're wondering how Brian does things around here, he uh, figured out when Mother's Day was, and then he said, Romans 7, 14 to 25, which is a passage we're going to read today, which is all about sin. He said, I'm going to pick out that passage, and we'll put it right on Mother's Day there, and then I'll work backwards, and we'll figure out when to start the series. No, I'm kidding, right? This is just kind of where we find ourselves in the book of Romans. So happy Mother's Day. Good to see you all. Uh, let's go on a little bit of a journey this morning into the book of Romans chapter 7. So if you're anything like me, uh, you might be able to resonate with this. Uh, every couple of months or so, I have to take a look at my schedule and redo it again and work on it again and get better at it again because of how bad I am at keeping it going all the time. We had to do this just a couple weeks ago. My wife and I, we sat down together and finally for myself, um, as a very busy dad, as a lot of you know, if you're, if you're a parent, just how busy and packed life can get, I have this long list of stuff that I would love to be doing on a daily basis. I just really don't find I have a whole lot of time to do all of it. And so what I had to do is I had to look at my time of day from like 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. And I'm like, that's my time right there. That's the time when everybody else is asleep. I've been waking up early for years. Pretty much once the kids came, I was up at four anyways, uh, except for last night when the dog got me up at three, but that's a different story. So I have this schedule that I started making, right? And most mornings I, I try to get a workout in. I try to read the Bible and pray. I'll try to read something else. I have to take the dog on a walk every morning. So I have this very busy, packed schedule, but it's great. It's intentional. It's these first three hours of the day, and it totally sets me up for a great day. And so I redid the schedule. I got more specific about it again just a few weeks ago. I said, all right, I, I was waking up a little bit later, a little bit later. I need to get back on track, 4 a.m. again. Here's what my schedule is looking like. Great. I was doing it. Monday was awesome. It was great. It went exactly to plan. Tuesday, what a good day. It was so good. I was feeling so amped up. I was doing an even longer workout. I decided to do it upstairs for some reason. We have a perfectly good downstairs I could have been doing it. But my wife wakes up at 6 a.m. to me working out. She goes, you know, this is the worst way to work out is hearing you huffing and puffing from across the house. So I learned my lesson. So I took that comment. I thought, I'll show her. I went out and I ran a couple miles with the dog and came back just out of spite, just to show her. I am on a new schedule. I know what I'm doing here. And then Wednesday morning came. I was feeling kind of tired from the day before. And I woke up around 4.30, just a little late. And I just thought, man, I'll get the coffee going. I'm just going to sit down while I wait for the coffee on the couch. Have you ever done this? <laughs> I'm just going to sit down for a quick moment. And the next thing I knew, it was 6.30. And it was time for me to start making breakfast for everybody. And my whole entire routine, the thing that I said, this is, this is what I want to do, this is a good routine, was out the window. Have you ever been there? And then the rest of your day is just, well, it's kind of, you're just kind of floating through and just figuring out how, how to make up for it the rest of the day. So this law that I had created for myself, this law, this structure, this schedule that I said, this is a good law. This is a good structure. This is a good schedule. I said it was intentionally good. I mean, you can look at it and you can say, yes, this is so good. But this law did something. It highlighted the fact that I'm very often not able to keep it. Now, every time I look at my schedule in my phone, I recognize I'm like, all the times I missed that. I look at yesterday, I'm like, I missed that one. Tomorrow, I'm going to do better. So it's, it's good that it's there, but it highlights the fact that very often, I just miss it. Have you ever been there? Have you ever seen the standard that you set for yourself? I, I tend to have extremely high standards for myself, and maybe you do too. You just look at those standards so often on paper and go, gosh, am I ever going to measure up to these things? Because we have the best of intentions. We have the best of intentions to do the thing we said we would do, the thing we said would give us a better life. We know the good that we want to do, but so often, doesn't our human weakness just let us down? It's our humanity that, that lets us down. And you know, there's whole industries built on this. So think about like the self-help industry, right? Some of you might have read self-help books. You know, there's a lot of theories about how to get better at certain things, but you know what the best self-help books are? It's the ones that can actually give you the power to do it. Because for the most part, we kind of know what we should be doing already. 
we, we kind of know instinctually, uh, here's how I would live if I wanted to live a better life. The problem is this body and, and my eyes that get so tired so often and my muscles that get so tired and my inability, my, my unwillingness to actually carry it out. So good self-help would, would try to give you the power to do that. And this is what Paul, I think, is starting to drive at when we get to Romans chapter 7. He's getting to this point. Remember, this is a long argument that Paul has. We tend to read it in these short little bursts. Paul wrote it in 16 chapters, and the first church that heard it would have read it front to back. That, that would have been quite a day. <laughs> they would have read it front to back. And in one sitting, but he's processing through this. He's saying, okay, if Jesus came and was Israel's Messiah and lived the way that it was written that he lived and then he was crucified and then, and then he resurrected, if all that is true, that changes absolutely everything about the nature of life, about the nature of my life. And so Paul is fleshing all of this out, but he's coming up on a problem now. And the problem is that my body, me, who I am as a person, has all of these limitations, these desires, these needs. And so often it feels like what my body is telling me to do is the exact opposite of the reality of Jesus' resurrection. Amen? It so often feels so different from that. The thing that causes me to fall asleep on the couch, the thing that caused the disciples to fall asleep in the garden when Jesus told them to stay up, be watchful, be praying— that's the thing that's driving against what Jesus is calling us to do and who to be. And so let's read Romans 7 together. And let's, let's pay attention. I'll just give you a warning. If you haven't read it in a while, let's try to pay attention. It's a really tricky passage. Here's what he says. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it's sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. That is literally the first time I've ever read it without making a mistake. This is a tough passage, isn't it? He's going through a very much so an internal battle. This is a difficult text, so I like to use just a couple of questions as we go through difficult texts like this. The, the first question that I have is, who is Paul talking about? He keeps on using the word I, Right? He's using the word I. This passage has been around for about 2,000 years, a little less than 2,000 years, and people have been commenting on it for about that long. Who is Paul talking about? So we have some different options uh, of who he might be talking about. Uh, that Paul might be struggling with a specific sin. It might be Paul. That's the I. It, it could be people prior to becoming a Christian. It could be people's struggle with sin after becoming a Christian. Right? So you're a Christian. this could be you as a Christian. This could be you before you became a Christian. It could be him talking about Adam. I don't know if you remember back a couple chapters to Romans chapter 5 where he uses the image of Adam. This could be Adam. Uh, it, it could be speaking about Israel. It could be speaking about Jews. It could be speaking about Jewish Christians. These are all, th these are some of the options that commentators have given through the past 2,000 years. And there's almost not any uh, scripture in the Bible that's more hotly contested than this passage of Scripture. So 
Thanks, Brian, for being out of town and uh, offering this text to me this morning. But it's, it's safe to say there's really not wide agreement on who Paul is talking about. And as the week went on, I kept reading and looking into to these different commentaries, and they all had vastly different opinions and ideas about what's going on. And so I'm just going to share what I think Paul is trying to get at this morning. But what I want to say before I even get there is this. If when I was reading the text this morning, if you felt something inside of you, kind of nudging you where you go, oh, that's me, then this, the, the I in this passage is meant for you this morning. It, it's meant for you this morning. Just recognize that God is wanting to speak to you this morning and just let that sit. I pray that God would do something with that this morning. But in specific, let, let's just get a reminder. Who is Paul talking to? This original church that he had sent this letter to, it had Jewish Christians and then it had Gentile Christians. Remember, Gentile just means not Jewish. It's just everybody else. So there were the people of God. There are the people who, who built their life, who followed the Mosaic law. Mosaic law meaning the, the law that was given to Moses. And if you remember back at the beginning of your Bible, there's the first five books of the Bible called the Torah. It just literally means books of the law. Book of the law is what the Torah is. And so there's the people who followed the law, because Paul mentions the law, and then there was everybody else. There were, there were people who were in the church, and we think that this particular church had more Gentiles in it than Jewish people in it. So, which is good news for us as 21st century Christians. We read this Bible, the vast majority of us in this room probably are not ethnically Jewish, though there might be a few people who are in this room as well. But so for us, we kind of reflect where this is coming from, who Paul is talking to in this passage. But there's one thing that no matter who it was that was hearing this passage, they had something in common. And it's that every single person in that church, Jesus had done something in their life. Every single one of them, they were coming at it from different angles. They saw the world in different ways, much like us. But Jesus had done something in their life. And so they had this innate understanding of the way things ought to be in the world. And when Jesus came, they heard about Jesus or they experienced Jesus. And they all had different stories about that. They started to experience, this is the way things ought to be in the world and this is the first point, that whether through the law, whether you're a Jewish person coming at Jesus through the law, or you're a non-Jewish person, that all people, all of us, every single person in this room has a sense of the way that things ought to be. Every single one of us, I see some of you nodding even as I say that, you, you have a sense that there's a certain way that things ought to be. I, I want to highlight this. This is in Romans chapter 2. So this is 5 chapters before. Listen to what Paul says about Gentiles. He says, Indeed, when Gentiles who, have not, uh, who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. So he's saying there's something written into our hearts. It's the same point in Romans chapter 2 and now it's being embodied in a character in Romans chapter 7. The I is this character who is embodying out this reality from Romans chapter 2. In fact, there's this word that Paul uses in verse 19. Verse 19 says, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. If you look at that word evil, in the Greek it, it means kakas, and it means of a bad nature, not such as it ought to be. You hear that? This word for evil, it's of a bad nature. It's not how it ought to be. And, and when you look into what the commentators, what they say about that particular word in this particular instance, they say it's actually ongoing. That the evil that's talked about in verse 19 of chapter 7, it's an evil that's ongoing. So here's the reality that all people live in such a way that you know, you can feel that there's this ongoing sense that things are not the way they should be. And that's what Paul is trying to bring out, that there's this way of living. And I think all of us have experienced that 
to some degree where it's just like things keep going and I know there's got to be more to life than this. Have you ever felt that way? I know there's got to be more to life with this. And you can come from a Jewish background uh, with all the, la- the laws that describe this reality, uh, but you really don't need to because, because the reality is that there's this word that means that this, this foundational dissonance when we live in such a way that no matter your background, you can feel when you sin because you know that you're out of sync with the way that the world is supposed to be. I've got this friend who I hadn't talked to in 10 to 15 years, and he just reconnected with me uh, over the past couple months. He would have definitely called himself a Christian uh, back when we were hanging out more, and he was, he was living that kind of a life, and, and it was great at that time, but he's really, for the past 10 to 15 years, just totally set that aside. He just decided, I'm going to do whatever it is I want to do. Whatever it is I feel like doing, I'm going to do. Uh, Brian used the phrase last week uh, about really the cultural motto that we, I mean, our world lives by is to be true to yourself. Well, he's been true to himself for sure over the past 10 to 15 years. Not a Christian, outside the law, not even trying. Uh, and what he's coming to is a realization in his own life after relationship, after relationship, after relationship, after doing everything that he could ever want, he's finally starting to look around and say, is this all that there is? Is this all there is to life? I, w- I was told that this would be a great life. I was told that I would get everything I ever wanted. And he's finally coming to, God. thank God, he's finally coming to a realization that th- this isn't what I thought it was all cracked out to be. And, and so Paul presents this tension. He, he presents this tension about living a life where you're at odds with the way God has created the world. He creates this language of a person in Romans chapter 7, introspectively looking at their own actions and measuring them against the way that they know things ought to be. And he does it for a reason. Do you feel the tension when you read this, this passage? He's doing that for a reason. He's trying to build a tension as you read this. And this insight actually will help us answer the question, so who is the I that Paul is talking about in this passage? Because it's very, very similar language to the way that Paul talks about people when they live without Jesus in their life. Hear what he says in Ephesians chapter 2, and just, just notice some of the similarities in language. Paul says, as for you, You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Now hear this. All of us, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And so I want to say, who is the I in Romans chapter 7? To a certain degree, it's all of us. And certainly, it's all of us without Jesus. It's all of us without Jesus. Paul is talking about all of us to one degree or another. There should be some aspect, even if it's a faraway aspect of of a past life of yours from decades ago, there should be something when we read Romans 7 that you just get this feeling of, oh, that's me. That's me. That's what my life looks like when I'm separated from Jesus. And so the answer to who the I in this passage is, is our second point this morning, that this is what life looks like apart from Jesus. This is what life looks like apart from Jesus. Or to be honest, it's what all of our life looks like when we put Jesus to the side. You know, as I was working through this passage this week, I'm, I'm going to be blatantly honest with you. At the beginning of the week, I came in with a presupposition, and it was that Romans 7 is about Christians and non-Christians because, you know, life is life, and it's hard, and we all make mistakes and, and that kind of stuff. And so he's describing this reality uh, of Christians and non-Christians. Brian, before he left for the week, gave me a stack of commentaries because I was talking with him about this. I'm like, well, you know, the commentators can't really agree on anything and I was trying to figure out what this passage means. And he just said, here, why don't you read this one by Michael Bird? And, and he was, you know, I think he had a bit of a smirk because he kind of knew. There, there's some answers here that you could find. So I went digging this week and there was something that Michael Bird, he's an Australian um, theologian, something that he wrote in his commentary. He says, the I is not a Christian and cannot be a Christian 
Paul is not talking about Christians in this section since the statement, I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. That's in verse 14. Since that statement conflicts with what he says about Christians in Romans 6, where he declared that they have been freed from sin. The speaker struggles to obey the law, whereas Christians are free from the law. And his words really convicted me this week because he goes on to describe how in Romans 6, and then also where we're heading next week, in Romans chapter 8, Paul tells us that Christians are free. We are now taken outside of the bondage that Romans chapter 7 is talking about, that we're no longer slaves to sin anymore. I mean, this is so much of Paul's point. It's where we're heading in his logic. But right now, he's creating this person who's stuck in the middle. So he's not saying that Christians don't struggle. Don't don't hear me wrong. If if you go through lots of struggles, yes, we all go through lots of struggles. Because he's saying, we still live within our bodies. We still have all kinds of limitations that we live within. He's not saying that Christians don't struggle. But it's not the point of this particular passage. So then the question is, what is the point? And I would say that Paul is creating a character. You guys remember back to Romans chapter 1. And then Romans chapter 2, Paul created two different types of people. He created a person who is trying to live life on their own. And then he created a person who is trying to live life through the law. And and the shocking thing that comes out in Romans chapter 3 is what? That all of them, both of them, fell short. Both of them fall short. That we all fall short of the glory of God. And here in chapter 7, he is creating a character to make a point at this moment in his argument. So what is he talking about? Here's what he's talking about. He's talking about two completely different realities. Two completely different ways to live in the world. So in verse 14, he he starts by describing the law as spiritual, but himself as flesh. These are two completely different terms. Now, stick with me. This is going to get more fun in just a few minutes. But stick with me. You ready? The first word, spiritual, the Greek term is pneumatikos. And hear this, it means emanating from the divine nature or exhibiting its effects and its character. So you you have to, to hear that, like emanating, meaning the divine nature is coming up through a person when they are called spiritual. So he calls the law spiritual. He calls himself flesh. Last week, Brian talked about the law, and he said that it is an extension of God's nature. The law is spiritual meaning the divine nature flows through it. It shows you the way. And the word for flesh is sarkinos, which means wholly given up to the flesh. And now hear this, rooted. Think of roots. Rooted in the flesh. So, so there's one word that's spiritual, that's connected to a source, the God source, and through it, like a conduit. Love and peace and everything that that is God's nature can flow out of it. And then there's this other thing that's called the flesh. Don't think of it like your body necessarily. Think about it as a word that means like you're rooted and pulling out something completely different. What is it pulling out? It's pulling out the complete opposite of God. The way I would put it is one is drawing on God for its life source. The other is pulling and drawing from anti-God as its life, life source. Think about it. Jesus uses these images all the time. So just an example of one. John chapter 15, do you remember from Sunday school, the vine and the branches, right? The branches need to stay connected to the vine if they are going to bear fruit. Here's another uh, great one from the book of Jeremiah, uh, uh, sorry, chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. It says, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Now hear this. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. And it doesn't fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. I love that image. It reminds me of the image from Revelation about the tree that that has fruit 12 months of the year. This is an image of a person connected to God. You can go through a drought, and your leaves are always green. Another passage uh, talking about the wise person in Psalm chapter 1. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. 
And conversely, Scripture is full of all kinds of images of the opposite of that. What happens when we draw our life from anti-God? In Jeremiah 17 as well, it says, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, hear this, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. It's a sad image. It's Matthew 7, 17. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And it couldn't be more stark than Galatians chapter 5. For the flesh desires what is against the spirit. They're two completely opposite ways of living in the world. And this is what Paul is fleshing out. In Romans chapter 7, he's showing us what it looks like to live a life disconnected from God. And that's just a taste. You could probably think of hundreds of other examples all the way throughout the Bible that show you what life looks like with God and without God. And the idea is that we're rooted into something. To put it another way, to make it specific and personal for you, you don't just randomly act the way you do. You don't just randomly act that way. That's not just your personality. Rather, you act out of the overflow of the way that you think, out of the things that you watch and the things that you listen to. You want to know who you are? Pay attention to what is flowing out of you. Pay attention to what is flowing out of you, and it'll give you a good indication of what you are drawing from. There's two different things you can draw from. So, if you're here in Romans 7 this morning you, and you're feeling some kind of resonance with it, I want you to know Paul is saying that all of us, all of us at one point in time felt this way, experienced this kind of life. And the point isn't to necessarily be overburdened with shame this morning. That's really not the point. It's, it's more of a wake-up call. It's, it's a look at myself. How is my life? What am I drawing from? Or the question, who am I connected to? Who am I connected to? Because Paul is drawing an image of a person who is connected to the anti-God source. In contrast, come back next week, because he's going to show us exactly, he's building attention in you for a reason. So you can read ahead too if you want to, Romans chapter 8. It's really good stuff. We're going to talk about it next week. But it's not quite as simple as that. As we kind of turn the corner now, we come towards the end of Romans chapter 7. Um, I know what some of you are probably thinking. You're probably thinking that this all, doesn't it sound a little bit too simplistic? There are good people and there are bad people. That's, That's kind of the sense you can get from this passage is that there's good people and bad people. But the world that I live in, I'll speak personally, the world that I live in is that I know lots of Christians who have very shaky morals. And, and I can look back at the, in my past, in my life, that's true about me. So I know a lot of people who follow Jesus and have all kinds of moral issues. And I've met plenty of non-Christians who are doing incredible things, who, who seem to be really creating all, all kinds of good things in the world. So is Paul setting up this dichotomy of good Christians and bad non-Christians? I want to affirm that there's this tension if you, if you read that this morning, but I, I really don't think that's Paul's intention. In, in fact, I, I would like to suggest that Paul might be saying just about the opposite of that. Now, hear me out. I think he's almost saying the opposite of, of that because the person that Paul is talking about, I want to argue that they are a new Christian and they're looking at their life. They wouldn't even have these thoughts. They wouldn't even have this tension or this struggle in, in, unless they were trying to love God, right? If they weren't even trying to love God, they might not experience that, that tension. And so the person that Paul is talking about is a person that looks at their life, sees the limitations in their life, sees how they keep living in a way and where they go, ah, this, this isn't the way it ought to be. There has to be more than this. And it's a person who is willing to say, help. Do any of you ever pray that? I do. For it's all of the theology books I've read and degrees that, you know, that's my prayer so often. God, help. Where are you? Have you ever felt that way? This person, we struggle with it. Even as Christians, we struggle with so much. We go through so many issues And yet the point is that we're supposed to recognize it. 
We're supposed to recognize it. And, and the difference isn't that we're good. The point is actually, well, no, you're not that good. Paul, Paul even says it. He says, I'm the worst of all sinners. Christians are people who recognize, yeah, Romans 7, 7 totally, that was me, 100%. Help. They just go and take another step, which is to look to God and asking for help. And we see this towards the end of Romans 7, don't we? We see him say, what a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And as we move from being in the flesh to in the spirit, we recognize verse 15, what Paul says, that he says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And the implication behind that verse is that I do not understand what I'm doing my conduct is inexplicable to me. And we move into that and we say, therefore, God, help me. Help me. So as we look at this, uh, I thought a good way to illustrate this as we come to our close, and I'll move this towards the middle here so that, because I have guitars behind me, which isn't that normal, right? All right. So some of you know that I'm a guitar guy. I have a problem, but I'm working on it. And... Um, <laughs> It's actually, <laughs> I joke, I used to have a lot more guitars when I played in bands, and now I just have a couple of guitars. But I have two very different instruments behind me. Um, one, this one, was from 2013 when my wife and I got married. And this was about a week before we got married, and I went into Cream City Guitars and I said, listen, I don't need a nice guitar, I need the cheapest guitar you have. Like something that's in the back of your shop that's unfixable or something like that. I said something that we can write all over, and maybe you see that. There's people's uh, signatures all over it saying, you know, have a good marriage and that kind of stuff. So that's this guitar. Now, I never put new strings on it, but I'm confident because it does have tension, kind of, um, that if I put new strings on it, it could actually make some music. But it cost me $25, which is in the guitar world, that's nothing. <laughs> um, and there it is. It's made of not solid wood. It's made of some sort of plywood, most likely. All right, now on the other side of me is my most prized possession. All right, so this is a 1985 Guild. It's a very rare instrument. Only 200 of these were made. And it was made by a world-renowned luthier uh, who lives in Nashville, and I've talked to him about this instrument. It's one of those things that I picked it off the wall. I saw it, and I go, well, that's the wrong price. That's what I thought when I looked at it. <laughs> Because it was about a third of the cost that I thought it should be. It should be about a $3,000 guitar. And it was like a third of that. And I was like, well, that's, what's wrong with it? Played a chord on it, and I said, I gave it to the person behind the counter, and I say, hold on to this guitar. I'm going to go get my other two Gibsons and trade them in, and I'll take that one. It was kind of a love at first sight kind of a moment. Um, and the reason why is because the guy who built it is extremely skilled. When I was talking with him, he said, it's still his, he owns a guitar shop with tens of thousands of guitars in Nashville. And he said, it's still my opinion that this particular guild that was built in the mid-80s is the best thing that they ever produced, that the company ever produced. And it just sounds unbelievable. It's this awesome guitar. Now, don't get the wrong idea about this guitar. This guitar is not perfect. In fact, if you ever come up close to it, you'll see there's cracks all over the front of the guitar. It was dropped at one point, and there, this was cracked all the way down, which is why it was so... Uh, so much less expensive than I thought it was going to be. This part broke off at one given time, but it is still an instrument that sounds exactly how it should sound. I've got a friend who is a guitar builder, and he has a friend who's a violin builder, and he has a story about a person who dropped their violin behind a car. It got ran over by a car. And he said, the moral of the story that he told my friend, who's also a, a builder, he said, if that ever happens... Collect every last piece of the instrument and bring it to me. And I will put it back together and it will sound just like it did before it ever happened. As a true master builder can do that, can put all of the pieces back together. And so what I want to end with is to say, listen, the world is not split up into bad people over there and good people over here, is it? The world is actually a big mixture. All of us go through struggle. We go through issues. Some of us, when we look at our life, we have stories to tell. We have more cracks than the guitar in our life. We have more wounds than that. 
And, and we could tell, we could talk about it and talk about it and talk about all of the issues that we face in our life. So it's not that there's bad people on one side and good people on the other. But there's something that happens when we choose to follow Jesus, that we go through a transformation. Our nature, our character, what we're made of changes. And in that case, it's worth saving. It's completely worth saving. Even if it's broken and falling apart, it's worth saving. And Jesus is the type that will actually take those broken pieces of our lives, put it back together, and make it sing again. Is he not? He's the type of person who will make it sing again. And so as we move now, I'm so excited about next week. You should be excited. It's life in the spirit. This is how we live a different life. But let's not move there too quickly this morning. This might be just a moment for us, for you, in, in the quietness of your heart and just the few minutes that we have left here this morning to take a moment and to look and to look at the broken pieces, the broken places, the, the ways in which we do things that we know I really ought not to be doing this. This is a moment for you to give that to God. And so would you do that with me? Let's pray. Lord, this morning, we, like the Roman church, we have people coming from every angle of life. Some of us come with just a rich background in history and the church, and we, we grew up in it. And we just want to say thank you for that. And some of us, we come from the outside, and some of us are just even asking the question, who is this Jesus in the first place? And God, my prayer this morning is that even as we hold up our past or as we hold up the areas of our life that, that don't look perfect, that we'd be willing to say, help. We'd be humble enough. We'd, we'd be willing enough for you to come in and to actually be able to transform that part of our hearts. And God, so I'm, I'm praying for an openness in our hearts. I'm praying that you would, would turn our eyes to you, that we, this morning might be a moment to be honest, that even as we anticipate the life of the Spirit, what you're leading us into in the weeks to come in the book of Romans, I, I pray that we wouldn't miss this opportunity to look at our lives and to say, God, I need you. I need you. I need your help. And so, God, my prayer this morning is that you'd fill us with your Spirit. Even in these last few moments before we go out for the rest of the day, I pray that we wouldn't miss this. I pray that your Spirit would convict us and would also comfort us in this moment. And so we prayed in Jesus' name. Amen.